Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining today's webinar, or the second of uh, today's webinar, uh, which is titled Two Photos, uh, Four Ways. Now, based on this, this morning's experience, that was slightly ambitious, so it might be one and a half photos, uh, four ways, but we see how we go. But we will eventually get to looking at the second picture, um, but it just might not be quite as extensive as the first. Um, if you're listening, watching on YouTube, uh, thanks for joining on there as well. If you're on Facebook, hello to you. And finally, if you're in the webinar room, then hi to you as well. Uh, please come forward with your questions, comments, and so on. We will see them in the Facebook comments or the YouTube chat, or indeed, if you're in the webinar room, you can use the Q&A tab and then the questions will come straight through to us as well. And you might get an answer from myself uh, or Diego, but we will do our best. So let's move straight into Capture One without any further delay. So we've got a couple of images, as I said, or one and a half that we're gonna try and get to. So we've got this lovely shot uh, from Venice from my buddy, Steve Gosling. And this is how it is straight out of camera. More on that in a second. And then we've also got a street shot uh, from China, uh, from my buddy Farzan Kassam as well. So we will get to Farzan's shot. It just might not be as quick as I anticipated it would be, but there we go. Uh, and what the plan is for today is to take this photo of Steve's and then edit it in four various different ways. And we do something very, very quick, uh, kind of how I would edit most things normally. And then we we'll pull out a few other pieces of the shot, if you like, to then do a more extensive edit. And then we we'll do the same thing with uh, Farzan's shot here as well. This one's already edited, as you can see. That's how it is out of camera. So that's the plan. So let's start off with Steve's. Now we've got five different variants here. These were just edits that, oh, Mouse locator, not running. Thought, why isn't the shortcut working? Because I haven't turned it on. So we've got five different variants of Steve shots here. This is what I was playing around with yesterday, and I will try to roughly recreate what I did, but no guarantees it looks exactly the same. So I'm gonna clone this first shot, uh, like so, and then I'll tell you the edits that are on here already. It's almost straight out of camera. The only thing that I've done is apply a little bit of keystoning just to straighten up that left-hand wall slightly. Highly unlikely that these buildings are, are all straight and vertical anyway because of how they're built. You can actually see that one's tipping back a little bit anyway, but just to align that one on the left-hand side and a small amount of rotation going on as well. But otherwise, it's as it came out of camera. If you're interested in the camera, this is a phase one IQ 350, and I assume it's on a, like an Alpha camera because it's got a Rodenstock lens and you can see how nice and super crispy that is. So first of all, I'm going to just edit this to do the basics if you like. Oh, I'm out of shot there. I'll shuffle, shuffle over a bit. So simple edit, not doing anything too crazy, just essentially what I would do if I wanted to do the minimum. So the first thing that I would approach on this one is white balance. Now it's probably pretty good as it came out of camera. The only thing that we can see here is that the blue channel is just sticking out from uh, its other two channels. No, I don't want di dictation, don't know where that came from. Um, so I could be tempted to warm it up slightly. But to be honest, I think I prefer it almost as it is out of camera, or I could go hunting for something that was at mid-tone, which might be this roof over here. But it really needs very little adjustment. But that would be the first thing I would do. If it was horribly underexposed or overexposed, I would fix that first. Uh, Steve, obviously being the consummate professional, has not over or underexposed it, so it's pretty spot on. However, I would probably lift it a little bit, brighten it ever so slightly. And we've got a couple of choices with that. We could raise up the exposure, or we could bring up the brightness, or we could use a curve, a few other things. As this has some dead space here, if you like, so there's no tonal information from here to here, the result in that means that the file could look a bit on the flat side or slightly low in contrast. 
if I push up the exposure, it's going to brighten every single tone in the image from shadows, midtones, and so on. So if I drag exposure to the right, see how the histogram has pushed everything to the right hand side, which I don't think is the right approach for this photo. I might try something like that a bit later, but adding a bit more contrast in. So what I will do is just nudge the brightness up a little. That will brighten up the midtones, but this lovely tonal range that we have in the sky um, will kind of hold, if you like. So we're not gonna overly brighten that too much. So just a little bit of extra brightness. The only, not the only, the next thing I would do is always have a look at our levels tool. Again, because we've got this dead space here down in the right hand side, this might result in a slightly flat looking image. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just hit auto in the levels tool and you'll see what that does is just snap those, if you can see my hands, uh, it will just snap those two ends of the uh, input of the levels, forgot my words then, to the edge of the histo histogram. So technically we're kind of stretching everything out a little bit and giving us a good tonal range. And you can see what that's done up in the histogram here. Now you might be starting to panic and thinking, have I blown out any of my highlights? Uh, have I clipped um, any of the shadows? So what I would suggest is that you can of course start looking at your exposure warnings. Let's turn those on. And now we can see we've got the exposure warning popped up here. Am I suddenly in a panic about this and thinking, uh-oh, I need to fix that? No, I'm not. Uh, why is that? If we look at the, let's just fire up a little, where are you? Can't remember. Let's just stick a color read out there. So if we look at those numbers, if you can't see them, I'll read them out. 233, 246, 253. So nothing is out of range, but why am I seeing an exposure highlight? It's worth checking in your preferences. And you can see it here. Um, I've got my shadow warning pegged at 252 and the shadow warning at 2. Now by default shadow warning is actually off. So you might want to turn that on. If, uh, if you're wondering why you never see a shadow warning, that's why. So the reason why I'm seeing a warning is because the blue channel is at 253. So it's actually out of range. Why don't I have this up at 255? Because I like to have bit of an early warning if something is approaching going out um, as opposed to being out. But this isn't sending me into a panic or anything like that. I won't then immediately try and bring my highlight slider back and try and recover everything. You can get a little bit obsessive with worrying too much about the exposure warnings and trying to squash everything into a range, especially if it's a a specular highlight. Imagine this was a bright sunny day and the sun was bouncing off the zinc on the roof here. Um, no amount of highlight recovery is going to pull that back, probably. So if you start obsessing with trying to recover everything, you can end up with a very flat, dull looking photo. So just consider that as well. So what did we do? We just pulled in the highlight points uh, like so. That gave us a better tonal range in our histogram. We could almost stop there, but I will add a touch more clarity as well. And then at this point, <clears throat> I would be pretty comfortable with that as a minimal edit without getting into other theatrics and so on. Now you might think, well, that actually hasn't changed a lot, but if we look at the before, it's actually bigger than you might expect. So even out of camera, let's just put this on the full view. So that's how we were out of camera. Pretty good, nice impression, good exposure, all those kinds of things. But with only really a little bit of brightness and clarity and a levels fix, it's actually quite a bit different. So even if something looks good out of camera, it does often lend itself to just have a check of the histogram, can you make a, a little moderate improvement? And that means we've just got a slightly brighter, uh, punchier picture. Let me just have a quick check for questions. Uh, I think we're good. Um, yes, so far so good. Quiet punch today. So hopefully that means you are absorbing and not falling asleep. So where could we move on from that point? Because I'd be really you know, happy with this edit, everything is nice and sharp, don't need to play with that. Uh, I was asked this morning, what about dehazing it? Uh, we could, but to be honest, the haze is part of the, or the very slight haze is perhaps part of the appeal 
in this photo. Uh, so just removing that maybe takes away some of the atmosphere, but I'm going to do a little bit of that in uh, the second edit. So we're going to go back to our unedited one, or should we continue on from here? I'm just trying to remember what I did. Um, yeah, let's actually continue on from this point if we were going to do a little bit more, because those start points are pretty minimal on what I would do before doing other things. So let's actually clone it from this point. So if we say clone variant, we're going to get variant number seven with all the same adjustments as before. So the next thing that I would be interested to try, and it's always an, an experiment with editing, just because you think, I'm going to try that, doesn't mean you have to stick with it. You could always delete everything in frustration and go back to this point. But there's a couple of things that um, strike me about this. First of all, we've got uh, these buildings on the left and these buildings on the right. These ones are fairly contrasty uh, and punchy. And these ones, as we've just spoke about, are a little bit um, lighter, I would say, and also slightly lower in contrast. So what I wanted to experiment with is brightening this side and darkening this side and improving the contrast a bit to kind of balance up the two sides. Now, Steve might potentially be crying into his uh, cup of tea at the moment at the thought of that, but I thought it was a worthy experiment and then you can also be the judge of it as well. So lighten this side a bit, darken that side a bit, add a little tiny bit of contrast in those buildings and see if we prefer that look. I think I did at the end of the day, so let's go ahead and do that. So first of all, to brighten this side, the easiest thing to use, and we often think, oh, this is only for landscape photographers and skies, is to use a gradient filter. But it's a really nice way to get a gradual fall off, whether that's up and down, if you're doing a sky, or left to right, if we want to brighten up a bit of the image here. So I'm gonna pull this over to here. And if we press M for mask on our keyboard, then we're gonna see what the mask looks like. So I want a pretty nice gradual fall off so, so it's not obvious. But the way we have this at the moment, it's probably too, uh, it's, it's reaching too far over onto this side of the picture. So by default, your gradient mask is gonna be symmetrical. And what I mean is that the mask will be the strongest here, 100%. By the time we get to the middle line, we're at 50%. By the time we get to this line, we're at zero. Now, if we want to make that, um, I said symmetrical, asymmetrical, trying to think of the right word, uh, then what we can do is we can hold down, sorry, shift the keyboard over a bit. We can hold our option key down or alt if you're on a PC, and then we can click on our furthest line out, and then we can squeeze that up a bit. So I'm going to align it roughly with this building. So now we've got a bit of a sharper fall off. I could actually do that because this is the main building that I'm worried about really. And we're not going to go a crazy amount. Uh, I'm just going to brighten it uh, a little bit. So not by much. And again, I won't use exposure because if we start pulling the exposure up very quickly, the balustrades on this window are going to start to go out of range because they were already pretty close if we look at our, our um, histogram, they're already pretty close on this point anyway. So lifting the exposure is probably not a good idea, but we could pull up the brightness a little bit, but I'd still have to be careful. Or maybe even more control, I could just lift up, uh, let's just reset you. We could lift up the curve a touch as well, and then just keep control of our highlights and make sure nothing trips off in that respect. But we can just brighten that up a little tiny bit like so. It's not much, but I've learned that little goes a long way often with adjustments like this. So that's the first part. Now the second part I said was to, you know, darken this area a bit, maybe make it a little bit more contrasty. Um, Steve actually, I remember working with Steve a long time ago talking about composition. Uh, we should get you back, Steve, if you're listening and how the, the eye reads the shot, if you like. So we're starting over on the left-hand side, we're taking ourselves down the river, and then we're finishing up over here somewhere. So maybe this would help composition and reading the photo if it was a little bit darker as well. So let's try that. 
So first of all, let's call this left hand side, so we know what it's doing, or left in my own strange language. And let's add another layer, and we're going to call this right hand side, like so. Grab another gradient mask and do a similar thing. Now, each layer can only have one gradient mask, which is why we're going to make a second one, otherwise they're going to interfere with each other. So same as before, let's start drawing over on the right hand side, option key on the keyboard to make it asymmetric, and then finish around there. M on my keyboard to see the mask, so let's try that. And all we're going to do on this one is darken a little bit, but again, let's try using the curves, see if I exaggerate it, you can see where we're getting our adjustment, that's obviously too much, but pulling it down a small amount, so we've evened out the density a small amount too, like that. So without our layers, if we want to preview what the layers are doing, then we can hold Option down on our keyboard and click on the reset button. So that was showed before and after. So we've just lightened the left hand side a little bit and darkened the right hand slightly. Now if you feel you've overcooked it, we can always pull the opacity down just to change it. But it's very small and very subtle. Certainly learn less is more. I might pull that down a bit more. There is often a desire to over edit, to just go a little bit crazy, just because you have all this range of slider movement and curves and so on, doesn't mean you have to max everything out. Oh look, there's Steve. We'd love to. We'll definitely get you back. That's good. Uh, it's, it's on record now, so you can't back out. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so we don't have to max all the sliders out to, to crazy levels. Uh, the only thing I might do, because we're kind of adding a bit of contrast, let's pull that up a bit so the sky doesn't get too dark and too obvious. There we go, happy with that. And finally, I think I would potentially like to add a small amount, not much, just a little dose of extra contrast uh, in this area. Don't want to apply it to the, the whole section, just maybe a little bit here, just where it's starting to get a bit hazy, just a, a touch more contrast in, in that spot. And the easiest way to do that uh, is with a style brush. Now style brush is normally set in your exposure tool tab. I've moved them out and I've made my own, own tool tab uh, which is specifically for style brushes. So all I have is my layers tool and my style brushes. If you haven't used style brushes before, uh, give them a go. Uh, you'll see how it works in a second. But it's really an accelerated way to work with layers. Uh, if you're not super comfortable with making layers, setting up the brush parameters, all that kind of stuff, it, it kind of takes some of the heavy lifting away for you. So in the style brush tool, we've got built-in style brushes and custom, because you can make your own. But first of all, we need to pick a brush that we think is gonna do the job. So in this case, I want contrast plus. So as soon as I click that, you'll see um, a little tick mark goes next to it. My brush cursor tool has been picked automatically, and the brush has been set up that is sympathetic if you like, to the adjustments that we're going to brush in. So if I right click, you can see the flow has been adjusted. More on that later in the, the next edit. Uh, size and hardness we can please ourselves with, but I'm going to make that a little bit on the softer side. So now all we need to do, as soon as I start brushing, if you look up here, um, we've got a new layer called Contrast Plus, and then I can just brush that in where I feel it would help. So I'm just painting in a bit more along the buildings here, not too much down here because otherwise it's going to get too dark. can make my brush smaller if I wish, a bit more on the dome, and so on. Now you're probably thinking, well that's made absolutely no difference, David. Uh, but don't forget, having a low flow, and I'll explain this in more detail, when we come to the black and white edit, builds this adjustment of contrast plus up nice and slowly. And this isn't some random hidden adjustment. All you can see is that it's ramped up the contrast to 50, and we're brushing in that in a very delicate small amount. So if we turn contrast plus off, you can see before and after. Now, if you think I've overcooked it a bit, you've got two choices, because it's a bit strong for me now. We can grab the erase brush, 
and it's good if you have uh, this ticked. So link the eraser with the brush because that means your eraser is going to behave the same way as your brush. So if I'm brushing and I think, whoops, too much, I can pick erase and it will erase by the same amount. So I can just take out some of that heavy handed contrast I put in there and maybe a bit there. So that's a really good checkbox to know about and to actually tick. So now again, if we turn contrast plus off and on, that's actually a bit nicer and I'll back it off a tiny bit too. So we've still got a little bit of extra contrast in those buildings. So that's nothing, that's 100%, that's somewhere in between. So the opacity just gives you that ability to moderate what you've done on a layer, especially when you're looking at it retrospectively as well. Last thing that we're going to do on this one, I'm going to make a new field adjustment layer. And we're going to call this color grade. It's not really a color grade. It's going to be a slight color shift in the shadows. Uh, but before we do that, let's check before and after. So that's as it came out of camera. That's with our edits. Uh, and with no layers, let's option click reset. So that's no layers and with layers. So it's very subtle. But again, I've learned over the years not to be too heavy handed. But what are we going to do with this color grade? Well, if we look in the shadows, let's grab a color readout again. You can see the shadows aren't super neutral. So they're still quite warm tone. You might not care, actually. But I'm thinking um, I would prefer those to be a bit more on the neutral side. Did I fill this layer? I can't remember if I did. Uh, so if I press M on my keyboard or say display mask, I did fill this layer. So what this means is any adjustment we make is going to target the entire photo. So that's a good way of separating, separating out your adjustments into different tasks. And the benefit of that is having the opacity slider so you can always back it off a little bit as well. So what did I say I wanted to do? Well, if we look at the shadow, it's slightly warm. So we can go to our color balance tool into the shadows and we can head in the opposite direction. So now that's gone in the other direction. It's now a bit on the cold side, but we could pull this back. And now that's a bit more neutral than it was before. So if we turn color grade on and off, it's super subtle, but I think I prefer how the shadows look if they're a tad more neutral. Let's get rid of that color readout. So if we pick our readout tool and delete that one, then job done. So again, very small, but if I was gonna print this big, that then that's something I think I might pick up on. So by just taking that warmth out of the shadows, this looks a little bit more metallic. So does this, we've got some windows over here as well. These were probably a bit more neutral without it. So now they've gone a bit colder. So before they were fairly neutral, but as this is the dominant part of the picture over here, then I feel it actually works in our benefit. To be honest, on our left hand side, you could actually do the same thing and that would just neutralize the shadows and that. So if we turn off color grade and then on our left hand side, we do something similar. Let's see if I really push it, you can see what's happening. Uh, but I could just do that as well. So either would work in this case if we wanted to keep those shadows more neutral over there. So let's do that actually. So now we can get rid of that layer. If we are being pedantic, let's be pedantic. Let's reset that. On our color grade, let's turn that on first of all. Let's clear the mask. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click and say copy mask from the left hand side. So that's going to duplicate our mask like so. So it's not going to affect any of the other parts, but the nice thing about having it on another layer, if I wanted to, I could play around with the opacity as well. Now, last thing to do before we move on is at the end of an edit like this, I always go back to my background layer and just make sure through any other actions that we've done on, on the other layers, we haven't clipped um, our levels to some extent. And I think we're probably okay if we turn on the exposure warnings, maybe a tiny bit, I just pull that out slightly. 
just to be on the safe side. I think the only bits it was affecting is, yeah, just the edge of our little poles there, and it could be slightly out, but I'm also not too worried about that. Again, if we look at the figures, nothing disastrous going on there, but it always serves to have a quick check because you might have done something on a layer, which just brighten the entire image a bit or an aspect of the image and you need to correct that afterwards. So once again, before and after, so that's like so. And if we just disable our layers for a minute, then you can see before and after. So this is moving on from that initial basic shot we did. Okay, let's check our questions. Um, let's see. Uh, what was the command to adjust the a gradient, James was asking. Uh, that was option click. So if you have your gradient tool up, and we're on a gradient, so you can see our three lines, sorry, they're a bit hard to see. On your keyboard, uh, if you're on a Mac, it's option, so this one here. Uh, if you're on PC, it's alt. So you just need to make sure you can see my cursor. Hold this down, and then drag, and then it becomes asymmetric. In the middle, then we can rotate like so. So it doesn't have to be perfectly straight. Hold down shift, and then it will snap to vertical and horizontal. If you're being really pedantic, generally doesn't need to be <laughs> that, um, that perfect. Uh, I saw a question earlier, can you explain the levels tool? Yeah, it looks a little bit complex, but it isn't really. <clears throat> so the levels is showing you the tonal distribution. So how much, how much shadow to highlight you have and its, and its distribution. So we can see on this photo, it has a, a lot of, or predominantly it's made up of mid to higher three quarter tones. So there's not much shadow, there's not much mid tone. Most of it is going on up here. So that's why the peaks are, are bigger. Um, what we're doing with these sliders is distributing that range better. So we're saying, hey, capture one, take the end of this histogram and remap it to this value here. So 255. So we're really, if you imagine holding the ends of the histogram and pulling it, then you'll be stretching it out to that figure at the top, 255. Uh, if you look at the histogram, you can see exactly what that's done. We've stretched the histogram out. If I was to pull this one back, I would stop my fingers stretching it that far. Uh, but we want the full tonal range so we can pull that across. When would you adjust this number? Generally, if you're going to print and you want to make sure you don't have any maxed out areas, this is a way to peg a limit if you like. But it won't add detail or color into uh, like a specular highlight or something like that. It won't fill it in with gray, but it will peg those parts of the photo which can be in that range if there's enough data in the photo. So let's pop use back. If I wanted to dehaze, I think that was another question. Uh, you can use the dehaze tool if you wish. Um, and in this case, we could, uh, let's go back to the original edit, but I think it takes away the atmosphere. So if I crank up the dehaze tool, you can see it gets more contrastier, less haze and so on. Yes, the saturation has gone up, so I would deal with that separately, but a little bit of dehaze, you know, can work quite nicely. But in this case, I think it just takes away some of the atmosphere. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Duncan says, is there a role for exploring saturation in an image like this? Yeah, I think I was going to try and do that in the next, not the next edit, the one after that, <laughs> if I don't run out of time. Um, especially if we do a bit more of a color grade, if you like. So we'd, we'd do that on the second picture, to be honest. Um, da, 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 da. How do you get the color readout tool showing in the image? Is it on the top of the image, but not on the image like David showed? So do you mean this one? So it's a cursor tool up here and you need to pick it, add color readout right here. And then you can just click like mad on your picture and then you can add as many color readouts uh, as, as possible. And if you want to get rid of them, where well, you can drag them around, you can right click and you can clear all the readouts. But it's a cursor tool 
that is sitting here like so. I don't use it a lot, but they are quite useful in certain times. Um, Monica said, why set exposure warning lower than 255? Uh, paranoia keeps me sane, as they say. So the purpose really is just to give an indication of, oh, this is an area I need to keep an eye on. Because if it's at 255 and I see a warning, I know that you know, I've blown it. Whereas if it's a bit lower, then I, I get a little indication, okay, keep your eyes on this area, David, because it's, it's close. It's going to fall off the cliff soon. Uh, but it's personal preference. You don't have to. If you would prefer to set it to the maximum limits, then please do so. Okay, black and white. So let's go back to the original no edit picture and clone that one. And then we've got our non-edited picture once more. Black and white, how do we approach a black and white edit? Or how do I personally approach a black and white edit? Um, I would not do anything to it before converting to black and white with the exception of perhaps adjusting the exposure. So if this was terribly underexposed or terribly overexposed, I would fix that before going to black and white. But it's not, so I would pretty much leave everything zeroed out. If you like black and white pictures, don't do this. Just drop the saturation. Use the dedicated black and white tool, which is in the, let's just close you, which is in the color tool tab, ironically. Uh, why should we use this? Um, because there is an image quality benefit. Certainly if you start to work uh, a photo quite heavily for black and white, uh, you might find, certainly on a rich blue sky, probably not on a paler sky like this, but on a rich blue sky, if you add in a bunch of contrast, on the blue channel you're going to see noise start to creep in. Whereas the black and white tool has some compensation for that. So it's very important that you um, use the black and white tool to get the best image quality. So we need to enable black and white. And then extremely unscientifically, the way I work these sliders is just to see what effect they have. So the red slider will just darken or brighten red areas of the photo, if we want to talk about it really simplistically. So I quite like the effect of having those darker points. I'm going to do that. Yellow, predominantly on this building, as you can see. So I'm going to brighten that a little bit. I like it a bit more high key. Green, probably not a huge amount about. A bit in the water maybe, but nothing to really get excited about. Cyan, a touch in the sky. So if we wanted to brighten the sky, we can do so. But I think I'll leave it alone. Blue, a little bit in the sky too, but again, not much to worry about. And magenta, not a great deal either. So not a scientific process, it's just based really on looking at the photo and thinking, okay, that looks about right. So step one, do your black and white conversion. Step two, edit as normal. Um, I would generally like to add a bit more contrast in, and this is where, again, maybe Monica, paranoia, keeps me sane once more. Uh, using a curve, I would generally go to a Luma curve. Remember this photo underneath is, it's a color photo. So it, it is based on color. So if we use an RGB curve and our curves are relatively aggressive or strong, we are gonna change the saturation of each of those underlying colors as well. By using a Luma curve, our color representation is gonna be relatively fixed. So the saturation isn't gonna go up, which I think gives me a more predictable result. I could be completely over the top on that, but it, you know, I sleep better at night for it. So I always tend to go for a Luma curve. There's certainly no disadvantage, that's for sure. So I'm gonna dump in a bit more contrast. We've actually got Steve's edit um, here. Let me find that. Uh, so if we go and find some of Steve's wonderful photography, Steve, 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 help if I was, so that's Steve's edit. So he's gone for a pretty, high contrast look as well, which is exactly how I like to edit my pictures too. So not quite as contrasty at this point, but we're not done yet. So we've added a bit of curve in like so, and to make sure the shadows don't get too solid, I'd also add in a bit of clarity to that extent, like that. 
Again, I just checked my exposure warning, nothing to worry about. It's relatively bright here. Uh, maybe I'll just pull down the highlights a touch, just to, just to make sure, maybe not that much. Okay. Um, what I do like and what I didn't spot on the color one is that there's a bit more going on in the water than I thought we've got a light here or someone having a cigarette potentially. Um, we've got a bit more marks here, another gondola lamp or something like that. So there's actually stuff going on in the water which might be fun uh, to liberate. Uh, I don't quite know how to get that out of the water. So using a style brush is maybe not the best approach because I don't know what style brush to start with. So what I'm going to do is make a new field adjustment layer. So if I press M on the keyboard, it's going to affect the whole picture. And then we're going to muck around with the sliders, again very scientifically, and see what works to get something more going on out of this water. Now I'm only looking at the water, I don't care what happens uh, to the building. So let me see. So I think probably lots of clarity might help. And then pulling down the brightness might also help. So we can see, again, I don't care what's going on with the building or anything else, I'm just looking at this. Maybe that's too much, maybe more clarity. Um, and if we look at our curve, can we play around with that to make those lines and marks more obvious? So I'm quite happy with that. We can see, cut. oh, there's one here as well, which I hadn't spotted before. If we turn that layer off, wasn't so obvious. This one's super clear now, we've got other boat movement and so on. So I'm quite happy with that, but it's of course destroyed the rest of the picture. But no matter, because what we're going to do is, is just brush in a bit of this where we think it works nicely. It's, as I said, it's hopeless for the rest of the photo, because we've got ha halos around the building. This is too contrasty, we've lost shadow detail, doesn't look great. To be honest, it's probably too strong for the water, but we're not going to bring it back to that extent. So I'm going to right click and say clear mask. Now all this is going to do is get rid of the mask, but keep those underlying adjustments intact. So if I clear that, now we can brush it back in where we want to. And this is where we can talk a little bit more about uh, flow. So I'm going to grab this brush and right click and get a nice big soft brush with a nice low flow. If I have my flow at 100 and start painting, it's going to look awfully fake. So like that. So it looks, doesn't look very natural. Um, so we need to be a bit more subtle with it. So I'm going to clear that mask again, and we're going to pull our flow down to something nice and low. And what flow does means with every brush stroke, whether it's a pen or a mouse, doesn't matter what you use, same thing applies. It will apply 4% of that relatively hefty adjustment. So we can brush back and forth until we hit the point where we're happy with it. So if I start brushing over in this area, it's going to be really subtle, like so, which I think is probably about right. Um, I find, uh, wrong button, sorry. I find this kind of thing is easier on a tablet because you are painting, essentially, as opposed to doing this with a mouse isn't quite so comfortable. So if you are gonna investigate doing a lot of this kind of work, it's much easier on a tablet. Doesn't have to be um, a high-end one like this, this rather old and battered Wacom now. Wacom, if you're listening, I am open to bribery. Um, but even the base model Wacom one, which is 50 euros, 50 bucks, 50 pounds or whatever, is actually a really nice way to get introduced into working with the tablet. Um, so that's probably enough, actually. If we turn that water layer off, you can see before and after. So it's only subtle, and we can do a little bit more down here. If we press M on our keyboard, you can kind of see the mask, but it's hard to really see to what extent you've brushed it in. One option with this is to turn on your grayscale mask. This will hide the photo and represent the mask in tones of gray. So if I do that, then it's very easy to see the variation in the mask. So the brightest areas are where it's the strongest 
and black, it's not affecting the picture at all, and the mid-tone greys, this is where it's, you know, 50-50. And again, if we wanted to reduce that more, we could pull the opacity to a level that we thought looked as natural as possible. So I'd actually pull it back again. So going from our original heavy-handed result to this, it's much more subtle, but having the heavy-handed start point is good because it allows you to just brush in a small amount of it. Um, Daniel says, how much can you push these black and white sliders? I got a lot of noise on a cloudy sky by overdoing the blue inside. Yeah, you just keep an eye on it. It would be much, much worse if you use the saturation slider. Um, so it's a bit camera dependent as well. So it's hard to tell. I think you mentioned you had a a7 II, uh, which is a pretty good camera. Like if you had a newer camera, you might find it's got better noise relief in, in that particular channel. Uh, you could also dollop a bit more noise reduction in, in just those areas, which also might help. But the black and white tool will do some of that lifting for you, but good, good question. Um, let's see. Uh, is this linear response or film standard? This is just linear response, I believe. If you don't know what uh, Ben is asking, this is the base curve that we can have. You can use something called linear response, which gives you a really flat starting point. I'm only a fan of it if it's really necessary. If it's not necessary, like there was plenty of headroom in the shadows and highlights and tonal range of this picture to not really need it. But if you've got a very difficult subject or, or very broad dynamic range, um, linear response can help you, but it's not something I would say turn on uh, for every single picture. Uh, wouldn't adjusting the black slide in conjunction with a micro adjustment on the contrast assist with maintaining details on roofs and bricks without making it a tad rough texturally? Just in the black side, like just in the contrast. Um, let's have a look at the roofs. I don't know if you meant with the black and white edit, but um, if we had the black slider in conjunction with contrast. Yeah, so if you were a bit, let's go on the background. I think what you're saying, Robert, is if you're a bit heavy handed with the contrast, you could bring some back with the black slider. The only thing, I would say it's pretty much photo dependent. Uh, quite often what you'll see me do is that if we open up the shadows, we can go in the opposite direction with the blacks to make sure the darkest areas don't get too flat. Uh, but it is very much dependent because the black slider only affects the very, very bottom. And if the roof, so if I just move my cursor around, you'll see where that line dangles about so we don't have much of the darkest tones on there and someone asked what's going on with this roof uh i think michael uh that looks like smoke from a chimney which is is pretty cool i think there was some on a, a different one as well anyway that's this edit so if we put on our before and after that's how we came out and that's our black and white which looks rather nice for this picture i think and don't forget just for fun you can also on the shadows, midtones, and highlights, you can actually put a bit of color in as well. So if you want to have a bit of warm toning, uh, you can do so. So you'll see on the shadows, it's starting to make those shadows warmer. On the midtones, we can triple tone almost, if you wish. So don't forget you can do that with the color balance tool. It's quite a fun way to just tint a black and white a little bit as well. All right, um, as I said, 45 minutes in, haven't got to the second picture. So even though this is not four edits, uh, we're going to stop there. I'll show you actually uh, the fourth edit that I did. Um, and this was uh, someone who was asking about saturation, I think, because what I actually did was a few of the normal adjustments on the background, but actually made it quite a bit brighter and bumped up the exposure. And on this layer, <clears throat> I took the saturation down a fair bit, so it's a lot more subtle, and also added a little bit of a color grade as well. So we cooled down the shadows or neutralized them, we made the mid-tones warmer and didn't do anything with the highlights. So if we turn that layer off and on, that's just adding the color grade in, and you can see the change in the side of the building here. 
like so. It's not my favorite edit. I think I would personally take the black and white um, or the kind of black and white looks rather nice, I'd say, or the somewhere in between the first uh, and the second. But this is one of those versatile pictures that you can pretty much do anything with, actually. Uh, if we just go back to this one and open up some Capture One styles, uh, what was I going to say, Beyond Film, you know, all these different film styles, it kind of looks a winner on all of them, to be honest. Some are a bit strong, but we could add it as a layer and dial it back, but it's, it's a really nice, versatile photo. Okay, moving on, let's go to China. Um, and I'm going to reset that and see how it looks out of camera. This is also a good highlight discussion as well, which we come to it. And it's also a good shot that looks great out of camera too. Um, but again, without much fiddling or editing around, I'm just going to check something on this. Um, we can bring it a fairly long way. So this is a good white balance discussion too. Um, it's late-ish in the day, it's around five o'clock, so sun is going down, we've got longer shadows, we've got this nice warm tone up here, but these boys are standing in shadows, so they're going to be a bit colder. So we could say, are we sympathetic to that, or should it be a little bit warmer or somewhere in between? I clicked around a bit with the white balance dropper and kind of settled on a bit of a compromise to something like that. So they're still a bit colder, but this warms up this area ever so slightly opposed to the out of camera result. So that's out of camera, that's slightly warmer. And I keep going back and forth with trying to decide uh, what I prefer. So, but let's try this. Um, but what struck me about this picture is if we just improve our levels, so let's say auto on the levels, I think that helps this picture a huge amount, just adds a bit of punch and contrast. And all we did was bring the level slider in, which is almost dehazing it in a way, but that suddenly improves it in a long way. But what bothered me about this picture is that our star of the show, our main attraction, uh, this man and this gentleman here as well, he, he's almost blended into the background a bit. Um, his face is a bit flat, uh, not flat in contrast. Um, so we want to try and make this a bit contrastier because he's he's almost, he's not standing out from the background enough, even though this is out of focus. So I feel we need to improve that. Now with regards to exposure warnings, if we turn those on, big alarm bells here, this is all out of range. Do I care? No, I don't actually because the sun is sitting behind that roof. If you were watching that in the daytime, it's very likely, even though our human eye has incredible capability of dynamic range, that's still gonna look fairly bright. We could actually, if we wanted to, bring it back into range. But now I think that just looks a bit unrealistic and we've reduced the impact of this rather nice sun flare at the top. So I would personally leave that well alone and not worry about the exposure warning. If anything, I would bring it down a tiny, tiny touch, but it really doesn't bother me and I don't think it should bother you either. So what do we want to do about this gentleman being slightly lacking in contrast? Another good job for a contrast brush. So if we grab contrast plus, plus, contrast plus, contrast plus, go over onto the picture, and that's roughly about right. And then I'm going to dial in a bit more contrast just at this point. And also because the contrast has bumped up the saturation a bit, I'm going to kill the contrast on that spot too. Now what that's done, I'll put a bit more on the front of his jacket, maybe on this gent as well, and on the bike, like so. It's just popped him out a little bit more. It wasn't much. So if I turn this back off, so you see now they've gone quite flat. I mean, the sun is blasting right in the middle of the lens, really. It's quite impressive that it hasn't completely turned to mess. But just adding that jumps him off the background that little bit more. We could also brighten that. So if I do it ridiculous amounts, you can see what's happening. But with a couple of points, 
that would help as well. And I think that kind of makes all the difference, really. Uh, the only other thing which I missed actually earlier is just to give that a couple of degrees of rotation. I wonder how auto rotate does on that one. Eh, it's not bad. It's kind of aligned it around those spots, but I'd back it off ever so slightly to around there. So that's a, a nice edit where I think I would stop. Well, that's, that's not true. There is something else I would do, but for a, a basic edit, that's pretty much where I would, would draw the line at without doing anything else. What was nice about this picture is if we do another, uh, let's go for a new variant once more. So we've got this one here. This was shot on a, wrong shortcut. This was shot on a Fuji GFX uh, 100S, I believe. Really good camera. Um, so nice that you can travel with 100 megapixels and do street photography with it, which is pretty cool. But what this picture looks really nice with, because we have access to the Fuji film simulations, was, uh, what was it, classic negative? I can't remember now, which one did I like? I think it was classic negative. Was a pretty good out of the box result like so, without doing a great deal. I think I would still bump up the contrast here a bit. So once again, grab our contrast plus, whoops and then just add a bit more contrast into the front here. Just helps pop those gents off, off the page. Take down the contrast, sorry, the saturation, a couple of points. And again, that just brings them off. Uh, opacity, I might bring that down a bit. And just with that film sim and that adjustment, it's actually really very, very nice. Um, what I would do, and I have to give a nod to another photographer here, John Wild Goose, uh, who's been very supportive in the past number of years in supplying me with sample images for me to muck around on. Uh, first of all, he was a good inspiration for subtle changes like this. So before knowing John's photography, I never would have thought to do such a small minor change, but results in a, in a big impact but he's also very conscious of doing little cleanups. And so when I say cleanups, I mean slightly distracting things in the scene like this and like that, which confuses the eye, if you like, or just distracts you. So it's very easy to grab your heel brush over here and just go on a bit of a, a cleanup mission. And I wouldn't even do it at 100%. I'd probably zoom in a small amount uh, and just go for a little bit of a cleanup. So I'd get rid of that one. I'd get rid of some of these white spots, which we can do nice and quickly. Um, and over down here, um, I think there's a mark on the brick. Now, interestingly, those are actually quite tricky spots to, to, to heal because it's on a brick, but Capture One does have, and maybe you guys don't know this, but does have a pretty good intelligent way of picking the source point that actually matches structures like that. Because if we turn the heel layer off for a second, that's right on the edge of a brick, but it's matched up the mortar line quite nicely. I'd get rid of that, the knocker on the door, because it's very close to his head and maybe a little bit distracting. And there's also a logo on this aircon unit. And you notice I'm not being especially fussy or um, detailed or anything like that. Really clearing up some of those minor spots. And that's it, I wouldn't get rid of big stuff like that. It's more those little tiny specks here and there, which that one I'd get rid of, which can be distracting. So now if we zoom back out and just turn that heel layer off and back on, so it's just a cleaner overall scene. Um, I was told off this morning that if this was a press photograph, that would be a no-no uh, because they want obviously the uh, uh, the integrity of the picture to remain attacked. So no healing if it's a press picture. Um, Thomas says, would I sharpen some parts of this picture a bit? <clears throat> I don't think it needs it actually because these guys are already pretty sharp. Um, but similar to the add contrast, the only thing 
we might do, but it could be too heavy handed is add detail in this brush and maybe just a little bit on these guys and stop. And this adds some clarity and structure. But if we turn that off <coughs> and back on, yeah, it's actually quite like that. Maybe reduce it slightly. But everywhere else, because this was shot at a relatively wide open aperture, I believe. Um, where are we? Oh, window over here. Past the. If you're wondering why is there a gap here, this is the notch in the MacBook Pro 14 inch. So that's why there's a, a funny gap there. Um, so um, I need to look in view and say show labels. So this was a f2.8. So there's not a great deal that's in focus. So I wouldn't sharpen anything else up, but these two gents, again, to make them hop off the page, that's actually a good, good tip. So if we look at before and after, straight out of camera and with a few edits. I actually really like the light that lands on the V-neck of his um, gilet there, actually. And that's not really intentional. It just all of a sudden, they now separate out from uh, the picture. And again, that's not a big adjustment. If we option click on our layers, you can see no layers and with layers. So that little tiny contrast plus adjustment does make all the difference. How are we doing for time? Let's uh, answer a few more questions and see. Uh, Mark said, I find the light through the cart in the alley a bit distraction. Does it need adjusting? It is fairly bright there, isn't it? Um, I wonder if we could burn that down a bit. Might look a bit obvious, but if I grab burn over here, whoops, burn darken, uh, it might look super obvious, but let's let's give it a try. So if I just darken that down a bit, might be really too much on the other bit because now the cart's got relatively dark. Not sure what I could do if we look at our mask, if we stick a luma range on that and make sure it's only the brightest parts. Does that work? Uh, maybe, you might be onto something there, Mark. Just takes the edge off it a little bit. So yeah, I agree. Um, could you put a key line around the photo for display purposes? What we can do, uh, you can't export it with that, but sometimes what I like to do is if we turn on proof margin, this gives us extra view space around in the viewer. So that's this button here. You can adjust the size and the preferences. And if we right click, if you want to change the background, like if we wanted to look at it on a white background, we could do so for that. And that's quite a nice way to finally judge a photo, I think. Um, I often don't want those labels at the bottom. I just find them distracting and it's nicer to edit in a clean space or we can hide the tools or you could even go full screen with fly out tools if you wish. So lots of different ways that you could edit, of course. Let's see. Um, I think if you did a highlight reduction on the window of the cart, that would have helped. There we go. So someone else in agreement there. Um, so we answered your question. Um, just checking for any others. Um, da, 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 da. Is there any way you can get Fujifilm simulations in normal Capture One? Uh, this is normal Capture One. So Capture One Pro, uh, it's not the Fuji version. Uh, in actual fact, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we only sell Capture One Pro. Um, but Capture One Pro also has Fujifilm simulations. So just to prove it, I am running Capture One 22 Pro and it has the Fuji film simulations in there too. So if you've got Capture One Fuji Film on a perpetual license, um, you'll find them. If you've got Capture One Pro on a perpetual license, if you're on a subscription uh, on Fuji or Sony or Nikon, you're going to get automatically bumped up to the Pro version anyway. But they are there um, in Fuji Film and Pro version. Maybe you just didn't know where to look. Um, and also some of the older Fuji cameras. Uh, don't have access to F Fuji film simulation. So something like an X-T1, as an example, you won't see the film sims in Capture One, but X-T3, X-T4, GFX, a whole bunch of other ones, you'll see the film simulations as well. 
Where are they located? Kurt was asking. They are in the base characteristics tool, which by default sits in the color tool tab. Um, on auto, it will use the film simulation that you set in the camera, which by default, if you haven't touched it, is Provia standard. So there's always a film simulation on, on a Fujifilm camera. You can't turn it off, off, but by default, it's Provia standard. So if this is set to auto, it will use whatever you've set on the camera. But if you want to try something else, all you need to do is flick. So you can see the difference between these. Um, if we go to Velvia, then it's going to be super vivid, of course. Actually, don't mind that, with the exception of the skin tone. But otherwise, this one was classic negative, like so. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, how about X X-T2? I'm pretty sure, Cody, the X-T2 has film simulations. Don't quote me on that. You can have a look at our support site, support.captureone.com and then you will be able to just search for Fuji film simulations and you'll see a list of compatible cameras and what film simulations uh, are there as well. Uh, Fuji decides which cameras uh, have film simulations, not the other way around. So if an X-T1 doesn't have film simulations, which it doesn't, uh, basically we do what Fuji film requests with regards to film simulations. Oh, there we go. D Demetrius doing my job for me. Thank you. X-T2 also has the simulations. I think it, it was when Fuji changed something specific in camera with regard to processing. Okay, sadly, we are out of time. So it wasn't quite two photos, four edits. It was one and a half photos, three and a bit edits. Uh, I should know better next time that I'm not that fast. Uh, but I hope it was still useful to see a few different edits piled onto a couple of different pictures. So I think uh, my favorite, I think I like that Fuji treatment with the extra contrast and detail. And if I had to pick, I think the, whoops, let's turn that off. The color toned uh, black and white is actually very nice uh, for that picture. So there we go. Um, this was, of course, recorded because uh, it went straight to YouTube. So if you want to watch again, you can. If you want to watch anything else on YouTube, it's very helpful if you subscribe uh, and hit the little bell reminder. That means every time we go live, uh, you'll get a notification half an hour before and also at the time we go live. Quite often we just do a little impromptu live session, which um, could just be for shorter sessions, views showing you something new or whatever, which we like to do. So it's definitely a benefit to subscribe. Whoops, my arm just zoomed in on Steve's picture for a minute. So thanks to Steve for letting me uh, abuse his picture. Thanks to Farzan Kassam uh, for letting me edit his China picture as well. Uh, he's got a great photography travel blog called FC Racer. So if you Google FC Racer, um, he's very lucky to have visited some pretty awesome places. Uh, so check out his photography blog because he's a great photographer and has been to some great spots. So there we go. Thanks again, everybody. Hope to see you again on the next webinar, which is with Rachel Koronek of Two Love Studios next Thursday, who's a food photographer. And she's going to talk about um, color in food photography and editing in Capture One. So that should be pretty cool. Take care and see you soon. Bye now.